This is Tante Belle Cose, a podcast about the many beautiful things you can discover in Italy. I'm your host, Danielle Oteri. I'm a writer, and I'm the founder of Feast Travel, Arthur Avenue Food Tours, and Cilento Food Tours. For 16 years, I was a lecturer at the Met Cloisters. Essentially, this means I was a tour guide. The Met Cloisters is the medieval branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It's a small museum in northern Manhattan. It's in the middle of Fort Tryon Park, which, if you haven't been there, is actually the most beautiful park in New York City. And it's composed out of pieces of cloisters, monasteries, and churches from France and Spain. And inside is an extraordinary collection of medieval art from across Europe, including Italy. I loved working there. It was a dream. And it was a beautiful environment for me to learn and hone my craft as a guide, which is to say I learned how to speak to people at so many different levels and really figure out how to meet them at their level and give them a meaningful experience. Because art is something that is more than an interest of mine. It's really a vocation. And it's important to me that people have a little piece of awe and wonder that hopefully will enrich their lives. Very often I would have school groups, and sometimes they were kids from a tough neighborhood who were very hard to reach. But once you did reach them, you saw some magical things happen. Other times they were very young, and they would look at a collection of medieval art and ask questions like, why are they killing that man when seeing an image of the crucified Christ? And I had to figure out how to explain these concepts very quickly and simply. Other times, I would have a group of Carthusian friars from a monastery in the Bronx. They would come frequently. And then I could speak to them about the art in a completely different way, really focusing on their spirituality and belief. But most often, I just had a general group of tourists who showed up for the 3 p.m. highlights of the collection tour, and I had to figure out where to start. I would ask a few questions, but really you feel the energy of the room. And then the real work began of animating the collection and trying to draw them in. It takes so much energy to be a good tour guide. But if you're fueled by passion, it's very fulfilling. And the more people asked questions, the more rewarding it was for me. Just their smiles or their nods gave me so much energy. After doing this work, I have such an appreciation for performers, actors, and musicians. After one tour, I would usually be wiped. I can't imagine how people get on stage for two, three hours and sing their hearts out. It's really something quite amazing, but you are fueled by the energy that the group gives back to you. If you want to know more about my time at the Cloisters, I published an essay in the Paris Review in 2020 called The Secret of the Unicorn Tapestries. And there I tell an in-depth story about a security guard who taught me the art of awe and wonder. And so much of what I learned from him has informed the way that I think about art and how I choose to tell stories about it today. But all of this is to say, I am super picky about the tours that I choose to invest in when I'm traveling. And hopefully this is for the benefit of my clients. Because if I encounter a tour guide who's just spitting out factoids or giving you information without insight, no way, it bothers me. So the first thing I will say about a good tour is that it's not going to be cheap. On the first page of Google's, you will find plenty of tours from notorious companies, which are pretty inexpensive, but you get what you pay for. I'm not going to name names in this episode. However, in the subscriber chat, I will. That feels like a smaller, more appropriate place for me to get into specifics. And you know what? There I will just dish on which companies I think are garbage. (laughs) But one company that I will endorse without hesitation across the board is Context Travel. And that's because I have worked with them for years. Many years ago in New York City, I used to give tours of the Morgan Library and the Frick Collection for Context Travel. Then during the pandemic, I got an email that said, hey, we're trying to put together some online programs since we're all basically unemployed. Have any ideas? And I put together a class about my favorite villa that's near Pompeii, Villa Aplantis. I called it the Real Housewives of the Vesuvius Coast. And we were off to the races. And there was a huge community of people that formed both guides as well as customers. And we did online programs for a couple of years that were just absolutely amazing experiences. 
For us, the professionals, we got to continue doing the work that we do. We were able to get paid. And for people that were stuck at home during the pandemic, they were able to leave behind all of the stress and keep traveling with their imaginations. It's something that I will never forget. One of the most fantastic professional experiences that I've ever had. And so I was very happy to sit down and speak with the person who sent me that email, Petulia Melideo, who is originally from Rome, though she now lives in Scotland, and she continues to work for Context Travel. She has for many, many years. Don't worry, this episode isn't going to be a big sales pitch for Context Travel. Petulia and I are on the same page when it comes to over-tourism, and she really understands it from another perspective because she's on the other side seeing how these tours get fulfilled and dealing with the craziness at the Colosseum and the Vatican and all the rest. So this conversation is really meant to give you some insight and give you some ideas from the perspective of people who are most invested in this work. And we jumped right into the conversation with the question that is on everyone's mind. What's going on with these enormous crowds? Because nobody, nobody wants to be in a crowd like that, and yet they are. And the smaller venues, many of them are completely empty. So what's going on? I think 2023 brought the huge crowds of sort of revenge travel. And then 2024 was a bit of a question mark. Nobody really knew what to expect. In the meantime, some of the bigger venues changed the way that they were selling tickets and making tickets available both to individuals and tour operators, but also something that we saw happening more in 2023, where probably larger groups were coming back. And at Context, we deal with very small groups, so, you know, six, eight is our average max number of, of people. But we also saw something that was not happening so much in 2023, but 2024 saw a return of the cruises, a return of the larger groups, which meant a much bigger impact on those museums and those venues. And, and so what we experienced were really large crowds in the museums. And what's happening is when we have very big crowds and extreme heat, especially in cities like Rome and Florence during the summertime, then you have like a lethal combination of everybody, all those people, like you saw in those photos, standing in line at one in the afternoon or 10 in the morning, because that's when the crews dropped them off, or maybe that's when the bus dropped them off, and they're all trying to get in at the same time. And we have to remember, and this is something that being Italian, I sort of grew up with it. A lot of the top museums were not designed as museums. They were not designed to be open to the public. They don't have air conditioning. And so when you have 20,000 people streaming through the Vatican Museum and it's 40 degrees outside, it's not going to be a very pleasant situation because it's going to be very crowded. And so everybody's kind of rushing to see the one thing that they think they want to see. So overall is it is a very difficult situation to handle. I think a post-COVID sort of thing is people probably are a little bit more careful about money and how they spend when they are traveling. And so they feel like I can skip the lesser known site, but I cannot skip that big site, especially if this is going to be the one trip that I do in my life. We're spending a lot of money, but there must be a reason why everybody goes to site X to see the David, everybody goes. And so they are doing kind of like an one investment. I think one of the things that is not verified, it's more like a gut feeling, but I think that, you know, when all these people had trips booked and they had to cancel because of COVID and they had to deal with so many different types of cancellations, the ticket and the tour and the hotel and the flight and this and that, they became a little bit more resistant to booking all the activities. And so now they're kind of narrowing it down and doing, we're doing the big thing. If I'm paying this much money for this, I want to make sure that I do it right. And I think that that comes, that's, that's kind of behind it, which I can understand. And I really hope that as things go back to some form of normality, people will also realize the importance of seeing the other places as well. 
the phenomenon of over-tourism is happening all over the world. There are only certain places in Paris, Tokyo, Venice, Florence, and Rome that are packed, while other places are totally empty. And social media is in large part to blame, because the algorithms are in charge of what the influencers are posting, not the other way around. And it's a huge problem. It's the bucket list. It's the FOMO. Is you know their friends told them is they have to take their picture by whether it's the Colosseum or the David in Florence, and and I think sometimes you know it, obviously the David is incredible and and the Sistine Chapel is amazing and the Colosseum is fantastic, but we also try to tell our customers about other places that you can go and see where maybe there are not as many people. And where you can really get a sense of the history. I think a great example is is Ostia Antica, because you have this place which is just outside of the city center. You can easily reach it by train, uh, which is actually like a metro line. So you've paid the same ticket as a, the the metro. So it's what two euros, one one euro fifty, um, and you have a port city that is extremely well preserved. You can see shops, you can see the port, you can see the theater, you can see the houses, you can see the fireman house. You are pretty much by yourself. There are very few people, but maybe some school groups from Italian school. Um, You can have a picnic, you can then go by the beach and have some amazing pasta with fish. And you have just one of those experiences that you can't have anywhere else and without the crowds. And sometimes it's just about having the confidence as someone who's traveling to a new place to say, you know what, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip the Colosseum. I'm going to go to Ostia Antica. I'm going to, I always say, I'm going to skip the Vatican. And I know a lot of people are going to be mad at me, but there are so many other churches in Rome where you have Bernini, you have, you know, works by Michelangelo, you have Pinturicchio, and, and they're free. The Vatican is incredible and it's definitely worth a visit, but be clever about when you go. Go maybe in the afternoon rather than the morning, because the afternoon is generally a little bit less crowded. A lot of the cruises are gone already, Um, but also make sure that you complement that visit with some of the other things like the lesser known churches and just pop in. That's one of the advices that I give to people is just to get lost in the city and don't be afraid to step in a courtyard. Don't be afraid to step in a church and just sit, take your time. Whether you're religious or not, whatever it is, the reason that would take you to the Vatican. Um, but you can see some incredible works of art. And the same is true for Florence, for Naples, um, Sicily, Milan, Venice, everywhere. Really. Beyond taking a tour, please just be curious. Just like Petulia said, go into churches, go into courtyards. Everything that you find in Florence is in an art history textbook. I think we're so directed now by our phones, which in many ways is an amazing thing. Like, pry Google Maps from my cold, dead hands. (laughs) It's an amazing tool. I can go anywhere in the world. I don't have to worry about getting lost. And if I do get lost, I just pull out my phone. But at the same time, I think that it has also made people more hesitant or reluctant to just wander. They have the sense of efficiency that they want to go and see and eat the best thing. But one of the greatest pleasures about being in a city like Florence or Rome or Venice is that you can go anywhere and find something beautiful and you can only see it there. You can't go wrong. I think another thing to remember is that those cities are very safe, like Violent crime in in Italy in general is incredibly low. Yes, there is pickpocketing, uh, but I think if you're smart and you're not carrying around, you know, a ton of cash and you keep your belongings where you can see them and you're not completely looking lost, you're very likely to have a, a perfect holiday, like as in nothing will happen to you. And, and it's not like you're going to end up in a bad neighborhood or, or anything like that. I always say when, when I lived in Rome, I used to do our orientation tours. And I always said, you know, in three hours, I can't show you everything and I can't tell you everything. And I don't know everything. But my goal at the end of the tour is to give you the keys to decipher and understand some of the symbols that you will find. And I think Italy in particular is full of symbolism. 
And, you know, whether it's the family that built something, it could be the bees of the Barberinis or, you know, or, or why is there an obelisk, an ancient, you know, Egyptian obelisk in Rome, about 13 of them. But all of these things that then you say, oh, yes, this connects with that. And, and, and because of the history of Italy, they also connect across the cities. And I think that that is what then gives you the tool and the interest in, in discovering where I'm going from one place to the other. Another important point may not be obvious is that most art was created for an entirely illiterate public. And so even works of art or architecture made for the upper classes is full of symbols and images that you can start to detect. And as Petulia says, they connect across the different Italian cities. So a good tour guide can start to point these out to you. And one tour can lead to you noticing things that never would have before made sense and really enriching your entire experience. I think the reason that I got, I, my background is in law, and the reason that I got actually into travel, because I had so many friends that were coming to visit me in Rome, and I realized what a difference I can make to their visit. Because if they were just coming without having a sense of what they were doing, then they would probably get maybe a rooftop, or they would end up in a bad restaurant, or not, or missing out on the amazing churches and the amazing places to see. Um, I think now we, we have almost the opposite problem, right? Everybody's got their phones in their hands and everyone is like, oh, I need to go and see this thing and I need to take this picture. And you go to the Trevi Fountain and, and everyone is just kind of snapping away and, and not actually even taking in the fact that they're just mobbed by people. I think sharing your city with visitors is, is an incredible fortune and it, it's, a way of sharing love and curiosity and, and desire to learn. If you have everybody going to the Colosseum and nobody going to the Bass of Caracalla, that means that the Bass of Caracalla become this kind of like almost derelict place where nobody goes, but it, it's an incredible place. I mean, how amazing is it that we have a spa? That's the from, you know, the Roman Empire and it's still there and you can have concerts in there because it's such a solid and incredible structure that Every summer there's the opera. And so I think part of it is, I really wish that the Italian government did a little bit more to inspire people to go beyond this three, four monuments that everybody knows about, right? Rome is more than the Colosseum and Rome is more than just the Forum. I think a long time ago, people were really going for the hidden thing and like, I want to get in on the hidden gem. And now it seems like some, a lot of people just want to do the list that their friends showed them on Instagram and like, and then it's like, that's the opposite of going for the hidden gem. The destination needs to do more to make sure that people are confident going to places like Api Antica, Bas of Caracalla, and even like the Circus Maximus, I'm seeing what there is and up on the Aventine, nobody goes up on the Aventine, such an incredible place, you know, and like. You can go for a walk there. You have incredible views of the city. Nothing. Zero. The same is for, for Florence. You know, the old Trarno. And instead, everybody's on Ponte Vecchio. Everybody's just here around you. you feet. And some of the feedback that we get and they, when we manage to get people a little bit away from the crowds, even in the midst of June and July. And they said that is what made the difference. It's like being taken away from the crowd and being shown this hidden little corner that I would have never seen otherwise. One of the best reasons to take a tour to an off the beaten path location in Italy is because the tour guide is a local and you'll get to talk with them in English about all sorts of things from the history of the place to where they like to eat or get their hair done. And so that person that lives in Rome who's giving the tour of the Vatican, they're hot and tired too. And they're kind of treated like a Pez dispenser of information all day long. But having been in the position of a tour guide, when somebody wants to see something else and they really want to have a conversation about the city that they're visiting, it is an amazing thing. I remember this one instance of a tour that a family we booked in Florence took with our guide there. And Elena met them at the academia and they did part of the tour, but they were honestly just exhausted. It was the last activity they had booked. And they mentioned something about wanting to get their hair blown out. And Elena called up her local hair salon and she walked them over there 
And the clients told me that it was like the best day of their experience, getting their hair blown out. That's the kind of thing that can happen when you engage with a local beyond the really crowded destinations. This is your like interaction with a person who lives there, who is intellectually, you know, curious and eager to share things with them. So this is your golden opportunity to get uh, yeah, information about what it's like to live there. What, what, where can you get the best food or it could be anything. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, I always tell the story of we had, because we've been around now for over 20 years, we are starting to see the different generations. And so we had this boy who did the tour of Ostiantica. And because it was Ostiantica, you also, you know, got to see some of the archaeological sites and digs that were going on while he was visiting. And that left such an impression that then he went on to do a BA in archaeology. And then he came back to Rome and actually got a, like a summer internship with one of our archaeologists who was also digging in Rome. So he came back with the idea of like the body ex or the experience. He had that very special visit. And then it made such an impact that he then came back and that's what he's doing now. He, he went on to to study archaeology and to become an archaeologist. So it can really, I think, once you click that personal and very special experience, it can change your life then, you know, and your life and, and what your interests are, the discoveries that you make in life later on. So, uh, and it is a little bit easier if you're not surrounded by it thousands and thousands of people. This is such a great example because another big question is, should I take a tour if I'm traveling with my kids? Now, of course, having the skip the line tickets, which are part of booking a tour all taken care of, will make your life easier. But if you're not that excited to go to a crowded destination, your kids are not going to be excited either. If you're traveling with kids, the off the beaten path destination is definitely the better choice. And I've seen this happen in real time. If you, as the parent, are excited about something, your kid, however whiny they might be at the outset, eh, it's too hot, I'm hungry, I want a gelato, whatever it is, they will become curious. They watch you. I've seen this happen so many times. And even if they don't acknowledge it in the moment, they will pay attention to what lights you up. And then in the future, maybe you've gone and done a tour of Pompeii, and, and now you see something about Pompeii on television, there's a connection that's made, and it all comes together. We have this woman who works with us, and she's an archaeologist, and she's very clever. She talks about the animals, because she says kids always relate to pets and animals, and they talk about, like, what animal would you bring to the Colosseum to fight or to have, you know, games? And then she brings out the ancient Roman gladiators in Playmobil, so that the kids can actually act the fights um, in the quality, which is amazing, because especially when you have little ones, it's very difficult for them to sort of figure out what happens and visualize it. But if they can hold it in their hands, and she will bring in like, you know, an elephant or she'll bring in a lion, and you can have all of those with Playmobil. You know, you learn through play. That's how you learn in kindergarten and primary. And, and, and so it's all about finding their way of being interested in their topic and then leaning into that and then building and giving them the opportunity to learn at their pace. And as you said, if the parents are interested, the kids are interested. And in reverse, if the kids are interested, the parents are overjoyed because to them, it's, you know, I, we always say there are situations where a, a great guide will be able to pull information that maybe the kids already have from school, but that maybe they're not comfortable talking about. Italy is a very child-friendly place. Um, you know, even I have three children, and anytime I go back, I always say it's amazing. For some things, it's frustrating because it's very difficult, for example, to find a public bathroom where there are changing, where there is a changing table, right? Um, that's pretty much impossible to find. But more than once, I've had my kid, you know, a waiter say, oh, just change her on the table. You'll put in a, like, in a brand new tablecloth and let me change the nappy on the table. But, um, and, and so I think you, there are a lot of things that you can do with children to get them 
excited and to get him aw- away from those slightly uncomfortable situation where it's like super crowded, they can't see anything. And that's the other thing, you know, if you're in a museum and you're jam-packed with people around you and you've got little ones, they're not going to be able to see anything. I spend most of my t- my time in Southern Italy and, and it may be a bit different there, but, you know, you go to restaurants at nine, ten o'clock and the kids are all there and they might be coloring under the table and their parents might give them a, a phone to play a video game too. It's also not strange to to nurse, to breastfeed in public. I see that all the time. I see that on the trains. The integration of children into everyday society, I think Americans need to kind of shake off this idea that your kid is about to annoy somebody else and you're worried about that. In Italian society, it's a different Absolutely thing. Absolutely the opposite. In fact, if anything, I remember when I we had our first first one and, and we traveled back to Italy the first time. All we were getting is free stuff because it was, oh, take a cornito for the one, for the little one. And gelatino, and you know, like you get the free fruit, free ice cream, free croissant, because uh, the babies are seen as this, you know, jewel and, and the source of kind of magic almost. Uh, and I guess it's it's a it's part of the Catholic country sort of approach, right? And it's the family is sacred, and children are this sort of uh, sacred beings, and so a lot. A lot more is tolerated, I think, in kids. And I don't living here is very different <laughs> from when I go. But yeah. Is the UK more like the way the United States is? Yeah, it is. It is. It is more. So like kid restaurant will say whether they're kid friendly or not. But in Italy, I remember when I came, I was like, what do you mean kid friendly? It's like, I have a kid. I'm like here, I know I will always have a, fu- a changing table for any kid. Uh, so it, it's funny. But yes, it it is. This is the challenge that I give to people, uh, whether they're friends or clients when they're in room. And I always try and I say, you know, for, you know, the two hours prior to the tour, don't look at your phone. Don't look at any screen and try to imagine your life without television, without computers, without, and it, like pull yourself back to the 1600s and then walk into a church and then see those paintings and the trompe l'oeil, you know, and like the Chiesa de Gisru and, and then see the impact that something like that would have had on a person that probably didn't know how to read, didn't have a television, <laughs> didn't know good. Or did. This was the theater. This was everything, you know, and just these paintings would have had such an impact on them. Or like a Bernini, you know, like the ecstasy of St. Teresa. You need to force yourself to almost put yourself in that position to allow yourself to feel the magic, right? Whether you're religious or not, whether um, you're interested in art or not, but it is incredible. Uh, there's no other way of describing it, I think. And so being able to capture it is an experience. It is, it is what visiting these places should be about, I think. So whenever you meet a native of a city like Rome, you've got to ask, what's your favorite place to go? Uh, Everybody goes to the Pantheon, which is obviously amazing. But actually, my favorite square is just two steps away. And, and it's Piazza di Pietra. And it's just absolutely amazing. And inside this old temple that is kind of like built in what is now a, a, a building that is hosts the Camera di Commercio, so the Chamber of Commerce. And there is a cop place there and I used to there's the there's a law library that is just behind it and so I used to go to the library study in the library and then go for coffee in this place around and it's just absolutely so it's the place is called Piazza di Pietra yeah. and uh and it's the coffee place is now it's cafe la cafetiera I think it's called but it's a Neapolitan place so you can get like sfogliatelle and amazing the coffee is really really good and and you see a lot of politicians there because obviously you you're between the Pantheon and Piazza Colonna where Montecitorio is and 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 so you have all these politicians going there so it's just a beautiful place to do people watching because of course they're all inside there's air conditioning one of the few places where it's nice and cool. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tante Belle Cose. If you want to discuss more about tours, which tours are the best, which tour companies to use, this is the conversation we will have inside of our subscriber community. Now, all episodes are free. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, then you hit the subscribe button. 
that's just adding it to your feed. And please do that because that makes sure that we show up on your phone every Wednesday. But if you want to join the conversation, go over to Substack. And that's where the subscriber community can share resources and everything is moderated by me. So unlike some of these Facebook groups, which are wild, I will make sure that all of the information being shared there is correct and up to date. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week.